episode 124. Christian free will is incoherent. Apologist Vince Vitale did a review of a free will debate. See link number one in the show notes. The original debate is at link two. I decided to review Vince's review because there are some Christian justifications for free will that simply do not make any sense. I'll skip the introduction and jump right in at his first point. So here's my first point. One of the themes of the show was the thought that people are only responsible for their actions in a moral sense if they have free will. Any discussion of free will is going to have to address this point. The conclusion one comes to will generally hinge on how morality is viewed. Those who view morality as an objective set of laws dictated by God will tend to agree with this sentiment. But those who recognise that morality is a human construct and that our moral intuitions are a product of genetics and social engineering will see that this simplistic approach doesn't really address all of the issues around what we perceive as free will and the social responsibility we should take for our behaviour. Now, even without free will, they might be responsible in some causal sense, like the way a hurricane might be responsible for knocking down a tree. But you might think that to be morally responsible for an action, in other words, deserving of either praise or rebuke for that action, you must have performed that action freely. And if you take that view, you are wrong. Receiving praise or rebuke for an action forms part of the social engineering that helps us to make decisions. This is why children have behavioural star charts. They are not yet mature enough to comprehend the knock-on consequences of their behaviour, so we motivate them to do what we want them to do through rewards. I do the same with my dogs, and the result is dogs that behave by my standard of better. Giving people praise for an action increases the chances of them doing that action again, while rebuke lowers it. Free will is not required. If I were to sort of trip over coming off this stage, and I, Please don't. And I pushed <laughs> Alex off the stage, but I sort of fell into him, he fell off the stage, then that would be pretty bad, right? But if I just got up and pushed him off the stage, that feels different. And the thing that feels different is that when I pushed him off the stage, I freely did it of my own accord. And when I fell and tripped, I didn't freely do that. That wasn't my fault. On a practical level, this is where it makes sense to say, well, as long as the action originates with me, we'll call it free, because this is really practical. It means that I can hold somebody culpable for pushing someone, where I don't hold somebody culpable for tripping up. That's fine. So on a practical level, when it comes to our laws, when it comes to the way that we interact with each other, we can use this free will, and I think people do, they use the term free will, to describe something like that, something like your actions coming from within you. What Alex is essentially doing here is differentiating between an accidental harm and an intentional harm. A harm that we do intentionally, or on purpose, is different to one that is accidental, that we did not intend. Let's hear what Vince has to say about this. And if you accept that assumption, one line of argument you might make, if you don't believe in free will, is to argue that because free will is an incoherent notion, or because people don't have free will for whatever reason you think, Therefore, people are not morally responsible for their actions. Um, no, for reasons I explained in a previous comment. Now, you might still think there should be consequences for bad actions. For example, you might think there could still be justifications for prisons. Yes. But they would be solely for the purposes of deterrence and rehabilitation, not for retribution. Rehabilitation, most certainly. Retribution... No. Because again, the assumption is that if we are not free, we are also not morally responsible for our actions, and therefore we should not be held morally responsible for our actions. No, no, and yet more, no. Not having free will is not equivalent to not having knowledge of consequences. Not having free will does not mean we don't have the ability to morally diagnose an action. Vince's assertion of this assumption is bogus and is typical Christian misframing of viewpoints it doesn't like. It's clear so far? Good. So the first point I want to make is that for a Christian, 
the necessity of free will for moral responsibility may actually surface a different line of argument because Christians take the claims of the Bible seriously. They take the claims of the Bible to be true. And the Bible seems very clear that people do have moral responsibility for their action. The Bible says it, so it must be true. We seem to have these like moral intuitions that tell us not to do that. So if you think about why the legal system exists, why it was invented in the first place, and a bunch of people going around murdering each other, and then collectively as a society, we realized that society would be much more stable if we had a legal system that tried to stop people from doing that. That's why it got invented. Before that happened, I think that biologically, our genes sort of did the same thing, but they did it with these things that we call moral intuitions. So on an evolutionary trajectory, those societies, those organisms, which have some kind of inexplicable desire to not murder each other, to not like when people murder each other, that kind of thing, to have a very specific emotion that, that like, makes you not, not like that kind of thing happening, and therefore less likely to do it, and more likely to be angry when other people do it, will make that society more stable. Organisms are more likely to, to survive if they have some kind of rules against that kind of stuff. And that's what gives you this desire. Exactly. A society that has no problem with murdering each other won't survive to be productive. While a society that sees willful murder as harmful, and therefore wrong, will find itself surviving. The result is that the trait to find murder distasteful gets passed on in genes, while the trait to willfully murder dies out. It is evolution in action. It is survival of the better. No religious text required. So if Christians believe themselves to have biblical reason to affirm moral responsibility, and if moral responsibility does indeed require free will, it doesn't, then Christians may have a strong biblically based reason for believing in free will. Sure, Christians do have a biblical reason for believing in free will. It does not make them right, though. Here's one more way to think about it. Two people might both think that moral responsibility requires free will. Remember, Vince only asserted that moral responsibility requires free will. Yet he keeps on banging this drum as though it is true. And he's not going to give any thought at all to being wrong. In this way, he's only giving half a viewpoint. In being true to Christianity, he assumes he is right and completely ignores points that oppose his view. One of those people might think they have an argument against free will and therefore conclude that there is no moral responsibility. Great straw man, Vince. Where's the person who denies free will but affirms moral responsibility? But the other person, if they are a Christian, might reason that because the Bible affirms moral responsibility, there must be such a thing as free will. That is also a rational line of argument. Sure, it can be rational. But only if you start with the foundation that the Bible is reliable, which isn't really rational. And so as a Christian, I need to ask myself, am I more confident that there is a successful philosophical argument against free will or in the biblical affirmation of moral responsibility? And confidence does not equate to truthfulness. But yeah, sure. Go be confident if you really, really need to. For many Christians, they are going to be much more confident in what the Bible affirms than in any nuanced philosophical argument against free will. And that, in summary, is everything that is wrong with Christianity. Confidence in what you believe, but no curiosity whatsoever in whether or not what you believe is actually true. I mean, even many non-theists find themselves with more confidence in the reality of moral responsibility than in any of the arguments against free will. And there goes that drum again, equating free will with moral responsibility. The two are not equivalent. Treat them as separate things if you want to have this conversation in a way that exudes integrity. Point number two that I wanted to make. We are not that smart. So often in philosophical discussions like this, there's this underlying assumption that if we can't understand something, that must mean that it's not true or it doesn't exist. Speak for yourself, Vince. 
The people I pay attention to say that if we can't understand something, then we should try as best as we can to find ways to understand it better. Because when we can't understand something, anything we say about that something is highly questionable and almost certainly false. The only way we can have any confidence in what we say about anything is if we make an effort to understand that something. Well, why did you go to the gym? Why did you walk your dog this morning? Because if I didn't, he wouldn't have got walked. So what? Yeah, I suppose I want to care for him. You want to care for the dog, yeah. right? Like, because you have this desire that your dog is in good health. Now, you have a desire to not walk your dog at six in the morning, but you also have a desire that your dog be in good health. Which of those desires was stronger? The desire to look after him. Why? Because I like my dog. But, like, why? It's <laughs> a good question. It, it just was, right? It was just stronger. And in fact, had the desire to stay at home been stronger, then that's simply what you would have done. So the thing is... That was pretty strong, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah, no, I hope so. I hope so. So, you know, if somebody wants to be healthy, but they're feeling a bit tired, do they go to the gym? Well, what's a stronger desire? What do they want more? To be healthy or to stay in bed that morning? Whichever one they happen to want more is what they'll do. Now, often it's more complicated because there are lots of factors. Going to the gym, maybe it's raining, you want to stay dry, you want to stay in bed, you want to hang out with your friend instead. There's all these different competing desires. And so that means that even when you do something that you don't want to do, it will be driven by some kind of other desire. There's a desire for something that makes you do something you don't want to do so that you can get something you do want. With respect to the topic at hand, free will, the assumption would be that if we can't come up with a detailed description of how free will functions, that must mean that free will doesn't exist. Oh, do fuck off. Did you actually pay attention to the clip you just played? Alex literally gave an explanation of the process by which we make decisions and why they are not free. He did not in any way affirm the idea that you not giving a coherent explanation means free will does not exist. Instead, he gave a coherent explanation of why it doesn't. But instead of being intellectually honest, you did the typical Christian apologist tactic of misrepresenting what has been said in order to make your point. It puts an awful lot of confidence in my intellectual abilities. You, you could even go so far as to say it sets me up as omniscient or as the standard of all truth because all truth claims wind up being judged according to my understanding. In that case, why should I take seriously anything you have to say about it? If, by your own admission, you have nothing coherent to say about it, then why should I trust that anything that you say is of any intellectual or meaningful value? In what I found to be the most refreshing moment of the debate, Alex O'Connor didn't make this assumption at all. Now he grants that Alex didn't make that assumption. Well, Vince, who does? I don't know who does. You've thrown the accusation out in a very vague and misleading manner to a mostly Christian audience, but provided no context or examples. This is why Christian apologists are very dangerous individuals. They'll make statements and accusations, like the one from Vince that I got colourful about, and Christians will aim those at atheists as though that's what they actually believe. Apologists like Vince harm intellectual dialogue between Christians and atheists because of the false impressions they give. We could be totally wrong about this. Yes, we could, and it is the only intellectually honest thing to say, but it's Alex that said that not the Christian. Ask a Christian to say openly, yes, I could be totally wrong about God, but I'm going to do my best to actually try to find out if I am or not. They don't do that because faith. And, and on paper, it makes absolutely no sense that consciousness exists. It makes none. You know, just a bunch of atoms bumping into each other and suddenly you've got first person conscious experience. No way, no way. It, it doesn't make sense. It can't exist. It literally is completely illogical. And yet, there it is. You're experiencing it, and you know it exists because you experience it. I'm just saying free will could be something a bit like that. Right? It, it's something that doesn't make any sense whatsoever on paper, but maybe it does still exist. I'm not saying that is the case, I'm just saying it's worth considering. Even though he used his brain as best he could to argue strongly against the existence of free will, there was this wonderfully refreshing moment in the debate where he questioned his own conclusion. And I absolutely love this for a number of reasons. First, simply because he admitted publicly and while being recorded that he could be wrong. It's called intellectual humility. You should try it sometime. It's wonderful. What? <laughs> Mind blown. When is the last time you heard anyone 
do that. We desperately need more of that intellectual humility in our public life. Thank you, Alex. Second, I loved this moment because by saying that we could be wrong, we leave room for reality to be bigger and more grand and more beautiful and more awesome than merely what we can figure out with our little brains. Personally, I love surfing, my favorite hobby. And in surfing, there is something called foiling, where the board actually lifts out of the water and looks like it is magically suspended in the air as you ride. For a while, it made no sense to me, but then I experienced it firsthand. I still didn't understand how it worked, but I knew it was real because I was seeing it with my own two eyes. Many people would say something similar about free will and moral responsibility. They might be incredibly hard to understand. They might make your head dizzy and even seem like magic, but I've experienced them firsthand. And here we have another apologist tactic, the irrelevant analogy. Take a cute story about something real and bend it into an illustration about something we are much less certain about. Foiling is real. We can explain it. See link three. Vince wants to fool us into believing that his experience of foiling is equivalent to his experience of free will. Go on, let's see an equivalent verification of why free will works. You can't produce that, which is why we can't take you seriously when you say you have experienced it. You can't tell the difference between genuine free will and the illusion of free will, and so you can't know that you've actually experienced free will. And no, that's not me doing what Vince said earlier about the assumption it doesn't exist if it can't be explained. I'm expressing doubt about Vance's experience claim. I have different reasons for doubting free will exists. And so perhaps in philosophy too, we need to allow room for knowledge that is more experiential in nature, even if we have trouble expressing that knowledge on a page in numbered propositions. Which experiences do you want to lump in with that? Okay, start with free will, and then what? Alien abductions, anal probing on an alien mothership, flying to the moon on a winged horse, walking on water. How far do you really want to go with this, Vince? And finally, a third reason why I loved Alex's remarks on this point is because he made an enormously, to my mind, an enormously helpful analogy between free will and consciousness. And his argument went something like this. He said, we could be totally wrong about free will. He said, perhaps free will is like consciousness, something which is real, despite being very mysterious and extremely hard to make sense of on paper. Maybe it is, or maybe it isn't. Or maybe, Consciousness is also an illusion and simply a feature of a highly functioning brain that is processing multiple inputs simultaneously. Consciousness, in this philosophical sense, refers to the fact that humans are not just aware of things, they are also aware that they are aware. I, I not only interact with the world, but I experience my interaction with the world. I don't just have desires, but I know that I have them. And knowing that has great evolutionary advantages because it creates intelligence. It creates the ability to think and to analyze and to predict, which gives evolutionary advantage of humans over other species. Wonderful, but not necessarily actually real. Could still be an illusion. How do you tell the difference, Vince? And I can self-reflect on them. I'm not just a robot. I have an inner life. There's something that it is like to be me and the like to be you is entirely dependent on the physicality of your brain change that through injury through drugs and the like to be you changes too and this reality raises a whole host of mysterious questions what is this me that experiences the world what is it about conglomerate of many millions billions even, of brain cells and the memories that they've processed and the experiences that they have processed that gives you the absolute fucking arrogance to think that you're right. 
And where is this me located? A pure gas? I don't know. Alex's point was this. On paper, it makes absolutely no sense that consciousness exists. And that is exactly why we should try to come up with ways to determine whether it does or not. Us just feeling that it does or thinking that what we experience is a genuine experience of actual real consciousness does not cut it. We need to be able to confirm or validate in order for our conclusion to be true. It's just a bunch of atoms bumping into one another in your head. It's completely illogical to think somehow that would magically produce an inner thought life. I mean, imagine if the atoms in a door in your house one day just randomly arranged themselves in such a way that the door started to think about itself. Huh, what? Christians have such weird imaginations. <gasps> Talking of imagination, humans are capable of imagining all sorts of stuff. So if we don't test what we imagine, we can't tell the difference between what we want to believe and what is actually true. Come on, Vince. Vince. Get there, please. Bloody hell. Intuitively, consciousness makes no sense. I agree. And yet, there it is. Are you sure? Are you really sure you're not imagining it? You're experiencing it right now. What I'm experiencing is my eardrums being bombarded with a load of bullshit. Free will is a, is a, is a complicated subject in many ways, but it's also incredibly simple. It's a bit like consciousness in the fact that it's simultaneously the most mysterious, mystifying thing in the world, the greatest mystery that scientists and philosophers have been battling about for centuries and more but at the same time, the most obvious and straightforward thing in the world because you interact with the world through it. Then Alex made his analogy. He said, free will could be like that. It could be like consciousness. Even if we have trouble making sense of it on paper, it could still exist. Consciousness seems so much like it should not exist when you try to explain it in terms of atoms and physical brains, when you try to give a purely scientific explanation of it, and yet, there it is. It's impossible to deny because we are using it right now to even consider the possibility of its falsity. Notice the tentativeness with which Alex used the word could. Alex said, it could be like this. It could be like that. And yet Vince went from that to the arrogance of it actually exists and you, yes, you, dear listener, are experiencing it right now. This is the poisonous bullshit of Christianity. Misrepresentation and overconfidence. I don't want us to miss this. This is a very significant point that Alex O'Connor is making because it has implications far beyond the specific question of free will. So often when we approach deep questions of life, we assume that if we can't conceive of how something works, then it probably doesn't exist. We need to break ourselves of that intellectual habit. What would you rather? To be able to confidently say something is real? even though no one can offer any confirmation of that existence? Do you really think that is more intellectually valid? It is this kind of thinking that leads people into believing miracles of statues drinking milk, when in actual fact something more mundane and less miraculous is happening. If we can't explain or understand free will, or consciousness, but we think we're experiencing it, then the only honest option is to seek ways of confirming our experience. The harder something is to explain, then the greater risk there is of us being mistaken in our beliefs. Validation of our beliefs is critical to intellectual validity. Notice how Vince praises Alex for saying he could be wrong, but Vince himself never once affirms that he could be wrong. Vince is displaying typical Christian arrogance in thinking himself the holder of truth, and only recognising the validity of intellectual humility when others express it. I mean, most people can't conceive of how my smartphone works. And yet, there it is. Oh no, I am so stupid, I don't know the difference between a smartphone and consciousness. Oh dear, fucking hell, what am I doing here? <laughs> and to go one step further, if you're a Christian, I think you have even more reason to deny the assumption that we should only believe in what we can thoroughly understand and to embrace Beliefs that are way beyond what we can understand. Why would anyone want to believe unverifiable beliefs about things that we can't understand? 
Vince's encouraging beliefs that are unverifiable, unconfirmable and almost certainly wrong. The only possible way to confirm that your beliefs are true is by validating them through a process that we can understand. If you are a Christian and you really do agree with Vince, then ask yourself this. How do you differentiate between beliefs that are wrong and beliefs that are correct? If you have an answer, let us know at reasonpress at gmail.com. As a Christian, I am deeply committed to this. First and foremost, because I believe in a God who is infinite and limitless. In fact, if I could fully conceive of how God works, that would actually be conclusive evidence that whatever I'm conceiving of, it's not God. Wait, you want to believe in something that you can't understand? Wow, dude, get help. And I believe God is omnipotent. So I believe he can make all sorts of things true of reality that are well beyond my intellectual grasp. And perhaps consciousness and free will are two of those things. God can bring into existence a much wider range of things than a finite universe can. Sure, if the Christian God exists, yeah, he can do all of those things. But why would anyone want to believe that without any kind of confirming or confirmable evidence or proof, if you want to use that word? And God might also have a particular interest in free will because of the role that it seems to play in meaningful relationships. So if you believe in God, I would say that even if you find free will baffling, you might still have very good reason for being open to the reality of it. Because even if we're not that smart, I believe that God is. If the Christian God exists, I can accept that he can do all those things. And yet, there is positive evidence that free will does not exist and that consciousness is a function of and inseparable from the brain. This in turn is evidence against Vince's God. And is why belief in things we don't or can't understand is absolutely not the way to a truthful or accurate conclusion. On multiple occasions in this episode, Vince criticised the assumption of non-existence of things that we can't understand, and then asserted that it was valid to believe, without giving any reasonable justification. This is bullshit thinking, and just one example of why Christian belief is a poison to intelligence and critical thinking. While it is true that not being able to understand free will or consciousness is not a good reason to declare that they don't exist, it is a good reason to hold any belief about them loosely pending further information. But Vince never once suggested we should try to improve our understanding. In his desire to create a bogeyman out of the assumption of non-existence when we can't understand, he clean forgot that the assumption of belief in things we can't understand is even more bogus. My third point is about the relationship between whether or not free will exists and whether or not God exists. This theme did not take center stage in the debate between Alex Carter and Alex O'Connor, but as a Christian, it's one of the very first places that my mind goes. What is the impact of whether or not we believe in free will on whether or not we should believe in God? All this talk of belief and not a single word about investigation or evidence. Christians are so disappointing. If something is random, then by definition, you're not in control of it. But if some event is not random, what that means is that something has determined it to be the case. Something has made it so that this happened rather than that happened. There is a semantic difference between being compelled to act and being freely acting. You can look for scientific causes of my actions, and that's absolutely fair enough. But a scientific explanation of an event is one type of explanation. You can choose to do particular things, but when you choose to do something particular, it will be because you want to or because you're forced to. If you're forced to, you're not in control. If you do it because you want to, then given that you can't control your wants, you're not in control of that either. Now, often it seems to be just assumed that God's existence relies on the existence of free will. That there's some sort of obvious logical implication such that if free will does not exist, neither does God. It certainly throws a spanner in the works of the standard narrative that Christians use regarding the Garden of Eden and the arrival of sin into the world. Hey ho. I want to question this. I at least want to suggest that the inference is not as obvious as we tend to assume. Here's why. Alex O'Connor's position, like 
uh, many who argue against free will is not just that we lack evidence for free will or that it is uh, improbable, but rather that it is a logical impossibility, that there is no logically coherent way to define the term, to parse out what is meant by an act being free. As he puts it, my position is not just that free will doesn't exist, it's that it cannot exist. But this claim of logical impossibility may surprisingly work in God's favor, in at least one sense. A famous argument against the omnipotence or all-powerfulness of God proceeds by asking the following question. Can God make a stone that is too heavy for him to lift? Uh-oh, we're about to have another one of those irrelevant analogies now, aren't we? Stand by. Do you see the problem? The question is supposed to back the believer in God into a corner. Either God can make such a stone or he can't. If God can't make such a stone, there's something he can't do. He can't make the stone, and therefore he is not all-powerful. But if he can make such a stone, there's still something he can't do. Then he can't lift the stone. Either way, there's something God can't do, and therefore God is lacking in power. It is generally accepted that this is a bad argument. And the reason it is a bad argument is because there's a hidden logical inconsistency in the initial question. God is by definition all powerful. And so the question is really asking, can God make a stone too heavy for a being with limitless power to lift? Which is really just a way of asking whether God can be both limited and limitless at the same time, which then reveals that hidden amidst the cuteness of the initial phrasing of the question is the fact that what is really being asked is whether God can bring about a logical contradiction. I'm sure there are many Christians who have thoughts on this, and there are probably many Christians who disagree on this. Personally, I don't give a shit. What I want to know is, is belief in Vince's God of Christianity valid or worthwhile? Just show me the evidence or fuck off out of here. But this is supposed to be about free will and maybe as an aside, consciousness as well. Get on with it, Vince. The problem with appealing to the old, you know, rejecting it as just semantics is that you're rejecting the very words that we're using to utter these sentences that we're both using right now. So there's a lovely line by one philosopher who says, yes, that's what free will means, but it's not what free will is. And I said, but the problem is you've just used the term free will twice. You use the same term each time, and that's your problem. You need to be able to explain that. So I totally agree that we can use science to explain events, but I also think there are some things which science can't explain just because it's the wrong tool for that mode of explanation. And how can you know that if you don't allow science to have a go at trying? So how does this all relate to free will? Well, if Alex is right that free will is actually a logical impossibility, an incoherent notion, words that we can speak but not actually something that can be coherently defined, then free will is like a square circle. Or God making a stone that he cannot lift. And then perhaps the believer in God can give a parallel response. Maybe she can say, look, if free will is simply impossible, then it doesn't count against God that he didn't make us with, with free will. That, that doesn't count against his goodness any more than him not being able to make a square circle counts against his power. And there's that irrelevant analogy again. Because Alex referred to free will being an illogical impossibility, Vince is trying to make it equivalent to the incoherent proposition of a square circle or a rock that God can't lift. But the issue isn't in the presentation of free will. The impossible rock is presented with intentional contradiction built in. This does not apply to free will. We can imagine free will because it does feel like we have it. It's logically impossible because when you analyse the decisions we make, they are always determined by the information we have and our preferences at the time. This is why no choice is free. Unlike the rock, free will is not designed to be a contradiction. Its existence is not possible and what we feel is free will is actually our brain processing multiple desires and preferences and calculating which one is strongest. It's not that God could have made us with free will and chose not to. It's just that when we use the term free will, we think we are signifying something when we are not. And therefore, us not having free will does not count against God's existence. 
any more than him not being able to make a square circle or an unliftable stone. And yet, free will is the single most common reason given by apologists when describing the fall of mankind and our need for salvation. The Christian message can only work if we really did rebel against God by free will and then, by free will, choose to accept Jesus as our saviour. No free will means that the Christian God is no more than a puppet master, a cruel and despicable being mistreating its creation for its own amusement. We readily recognise this injustice when Sid does it in Toy Story, yet Vince fails to see it in a God that withholds free will. Because like every apologist before him, no matter what the problem, free will or not free will, he will bend an argument in order to make God his conclusion. Such dishonesty. To summarise this point, it is often assumed that if free will doesn't exist, neither does God. But that is significantly less clear than you might think. Again, not really what people say. If there is no free will, that is a good case against the Christian God being a loving God. And it is a good reason to reject worshipping a shitty dictator. Acceptance of the existence of God hinges on evidence, not the idea of free will. Okay, my fourth and last reflection on the excellent free will debate between Alex O'Connor and Alex Carter. And I'll just raise this point briefly as a question for further consideration. If somebody wrongs you or does something bad to you, if you can remind yourself that they might not have had control over the determining factors that made them do that, it might make you into a more charitable and kind person. Someone barges past you on the street, or someone is cruel to you, then remembering that they're not fully in control, at least, at least fully in control of the action that they committed will make you into a kinder person, a more forgiving person. It will help you to understand people better. And I, I think that that's a worthwhile thing to embody. If God does not exist and all of life is determined by materialistic or naturalistic causes, if that's the case, then why should we trust any of the reasoning in this debate, or in any debate for that matter. If our brains have developed solely through the natural causes of a universe that at bottom is random and unguided, then why should we trust that what our brains recommend to us is actually reliable or true? Holy fucktards, he actually went there. What Vince has just summarized is known as the evolutionary argument against naturalism. See link four. The simple answer is, we don't and we can't, which is why the scientific method puts so much store into testing and replicating. But go beyond that and look at our legal system with its efforts to find truth through evidence presentation and how eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable. Our whole society works on the premise that the human mind is fallible and prone to serious error. It's only in the realm of religion where thinking up bullshit and presenting it as truth is admired. There is so much that we don't know. If you draw one circle on a piece of paper that represents the totality of all there is to be known, and then draw another circle inside of it that represents all that we know, the first circle would absolutely dwarf the proportionally minuscule circle of our knowledge. Exactly, which is why when someone tells me God exists and he's experienced it. I am sceptical because I know the mind can be deceived. And on top of that, there are really complex debates about whether exclusively naturalistic causes devoid of any supernatural purpose would develop our brains to be aimed at beliefs that are true or rather at beliefs that are merely conducive to our survival. And those are two importantly different categories. They are, but they're not exclusive. The two can overlap quite significantly. And it also reinforces the reason why testing, validation, evidence, preferably objective, is very important. Don't think up bullshit, then convince yourself that it's true. And if our brains are aimed at survival rather than truth, then is trusting our brains for truth actually a bit like stepping on a scale and expecting it to tell you the time? Weird analogy, but I guess it works. What it does tell you is, don't take people's word for it. Test them. Seek validation. Quite a good um, 
way to live, actually. That debate will continue, along with many others. And on that, we do agree. You have been listening to a podcast from Reason Press. Do you have any thoughts on what you've just heard? Do you have a topic that you would like us to cover? Please send all feedback to reasonpress at gmail.com. You might even appear on an episode. Our theme music was written for us by Holly. To hear more of her music, see the links in our show notes. <laughs>